If you would this morning, take your Bibles and go with me to Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew chapter number 4, we'll begin reading in verse number 1, verses 1 through 11 this morning as we look at this account of the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. And a beautiful story, we'll see what the Lord has for us from this passage of Scripture. In your Bible this morning, Matthew chapter 4, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus saith unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him a ki- all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, Angels came and ministered unto him. Now, we'll look here, beginning in verse 1, and want to consider the context of the Scripture. Jesus has just been baptized. I want you to know something. One of the most glorious baptism services ever, actually the most glorious baptism service ever, has just occurred. And Jesus Christ has officially began his earthly ministry. Uh, Jesus goes and is baptized. He obeys the Lord, sets an example for believers just like us and paints a picture of his coming death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, and soon to be ascension into heaven. His payment for our sins was pictured that day in his baptism and he begins his ministry and out of a spiritual high and a time of great excitement and joy and the prospects of a glorious future, This is what happens next. God sends his son, Jesus, to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Folks, I want you to know something. Just beware. In times when it seems like things are going the greatest, when God's doing the greatest work in your heart, beware there are seasons of difficulty that come with seasons of great victory. And the devil likes to get you when you're up, and he likes to get you when you're down. Pay close attention. Jesus is led, the Bible says in verse number 1, Jesus is led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted the devil. The first question I have to ask when I look at verse number 1 is, uh, why was Jesus tempted? I want to tell you a reason why Jesus was not tempted. Jesus was not taken into the wilderness and tempted the devil, led by God the Father into the, to be, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil to see if he could actually overcome the temptation. God had just recently had just said to, to Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There was no fear or concern that Jesus would fall or succumb to the temptation of the devil, but God led his own son in love for us to be tempted of the devil so that he as a man could set an example for you and me as to how we can overcome the temptation, the onslaught of the devil that comes in times when we're really high and times when we're really low. Jesus set this example. And as we read this passage of Scripture, God wants to teach us something and teach us all a truth that we can overcome the temptation of the devil. How many of you have ever been tempted to sin? Would you raise your hand? (laughs) If you didn't raise your hand, you're not telling the truth. I'm going to have to preach on thou shalt not lie. We're all tempted, but folks, I want you to know something. Though you've been tempted in the past and failed, though you've tempted in the past and not overcome. You have this glorious promise and an example from God's word that you can have victory, that victory is yours. The Bible says greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. 
And Jesus goes, and it's recorded for us in the inspired word of God. Jesus faces the tempter, and he overcomes. There's an example here for us. Let's look and see the condition that we find Jesus in. The Bible says Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, folks, here's Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, to the, in his whole life, never did anything wrong. But now he is a young, a young adult male. He's a man. And it's time for him to begin his work. And the first thing that he does in the work that God has given him is not gather a great big audience or a big crowd and preach the house down so that multitudes could, be, could come to faith in him. God leads him to the wilderness to be tempted the devil. <laughs> It doesn't make sense in my flesh why it would go to this way, but I don't you know something. God knows better than I do. And God leads him there and sets this example for us. He's in the wilderness. I can imagine the flesh that Jesus had. The Bible says he's in all points tempted like as we are. The flesh that Jesus had could have had the temptation to say, you know, here I am, the Son of God. I'm, getting, I'm going to live my ministry. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to pay the price for these people's sin. And here I am in the wilderness. I don't deserve this. Folks, when you get in a wilderness situation, you begin to look around and you get full of pride. I don't deserve this. You just remember what we really do deserve. You see, everything we have is a blessing from God. The breath that we breathe is a blessing from God. And we really deserve nothing but punishment. But by God's grace and with God's help and his mercy, we have the blessings of God. And everything we have is a gift from God. I deserve nothing. He could have said, I deserve this, I deserve that. But God, Son, Jesus, goes into this temptation, understanding that he must depend on the Lord. He was in the wilderness, the scripture continues and says, verse number two, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. He'd fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and now he's hungry. He's in the wilderness, he's hungry, and at a time of very low moment, here comes the devil. The Bible says, when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. We meet up with Jesus. He is facing the temptation of Satan as a man. We find him when he's very hungry. He has needs. He has desires. He has burdens. And in this temptation, we meet Jesus at a very low moment. But I want you to see the last verse of this passage of Scripture. He goes through three temptations, and in the last verse, verse number 11, the Bible says, Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. I want you to see this with me for just a moment. Here's Jesus starving nearly to death in his flesh, hungry, in need, the things that your mind is going through as a man after that much hunger, I can't even imagine. I get out of sorts after about three or four hours, uh, much less 40 days, you know. But he's hungry. He's in need. He's burdened. At a time of great weakness, here comes Satan. But at the conclusion of this passage of Scripture, here's the picture we get. The devil has tucked his tail and got out of Dodge. And Jesus is being ministered to by angels, getting what he needs the way he needs it from the greatest source of blessing, God himself. Folks, here's what I want to see. Every day of my life and every day of your life, we face needs and desires, and we have yearnings, and we have a life, we have needs that need to be fulfilled. And we get to spots and points in our lives where we're low, and we have sometimes no hope, it seems. And at those moments, it's when Satan comes. But Jesus has given us this passage of Scripture and this story and this hope so that we can be here today at a very low spot with great needs, and before the circumstances and the situation has concluded, we can have this hope and this joy and this peace and satisfaction knowing that if we'll obey God and his word, that we can be like Christ. The devil has tucked his tail and ran and left God's child away. And God, the greatest source of blessing, 
is faithfully meeting our needs and ministering to our needs and taking care of his child the way he has promised that we could do it. See, I want to have the opportunity to overcome temptation. And the Bible gives us this great example. Today's message is simply titled, Overcoming Temptation. We find from God's Word how we can overcome temptation. The first way that we overcome temptation is to know this simple truth. God's Word is more important than your need. God's Word is more important than your need. Now, that's a hard thing to swallow sometimes, especially when your need seems great. But I pray you'll listen as we look at God's Word and uncover this truth. God's Word is more important than your need. The Bible says in verse number 3, when the tempter came to him. Now, I want you to know something. When the devil comes on the scene, he comes on for one purpose and one purpose alone. He wants to destroy you. Sin is a captive, the song says. It binds and it holds. Satan desires to abolish your soul. You see, the tempter comes and his desires destroy your life. You know that the devil promises with his devices all the glories and all the beauties and all the experiences of life. But in truth, all that sin and the flesh and the devil has to offer with his temptation leads to death and destruction. The wages of sin is death. It always ends up there. The Bible teaches us that God's word is more important than your need. The devil wanted to destroy Christ. He wanted to destroy his influence. And this is what the Bible says. The tempter came to him, verse number 3, and he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. It begins with this phrase. He says, If thou be the Son of God. Do you know what the devil was playing on? He was playing on Jesus' pride. Jesus had just stood in the water, baptized of John, and God the Holy Spirit descended on like a dove. God the Father said from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He knew he was the Son of God. He had every promise he was the Son of God. And the first thing the devil does is come to him and says, if you're the Son of God, then command these these stones to be made bread. Prove your God to me. Prove it. The devil works in our pride. Show me you're man enough. If you do anything to prove that you're man enough, you already proved you're not man enough to withstand temptation. He said, prove it. Do you know that temptation is a lifelong thing? It was for the, for the Lord Jesus. Here we see Jesus at the very beginning of his earthly ministry. And the, and the devil says, if thou be the Son of God. Here in just a couple more verses. The devil says again, if thou be the Son of God. And as Jesus is hanging on the cross... The people walk by the foot of the cross wagging their heads saying, if thou be the son of God, cast yourself down off this cross. Now don't ever get the idea as a child of God that the temptation will go away. It'll always be there. But I want you to know something. God will always be there. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. As you face the temptation, God has promised to be your sufficiency and help you through every difficulty and every trial. And as you rest yourself On the Lord and his faithfulness, you'll see his victory in the trials of life. And it will be the victory through the trials that defines who you are as a Christian and proves your faith in Christ and makes you effective for God and his glory. You see, the devil looks at Jesus and says, If thou be the Son of God, verse number 3, command that these stones be made bread. If you've not eaten in 40 days, what do you need? One, two, three? Food. He's hungry. But you know, there's something interesting here, and I, there's folks here that know better than I, but I read somewhere that had Jesus taken and turned those stones at that moment into bread, and he got his belly full of bread after not eating for 40 days, that it could have been very damaging to his health. You know, Satan wants to give you something that you think, man, that would taste really good. But the truth of the matter is what Satan offers always, though it may taste good, it always ends in destruction. It'll hurt you. He said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. God's word is more important than your need. Now, here's the picture that we need to see. Do you know there's nothing, there would have been, there's nothing wrong with Jesus turning stone 
into bread. It'll just be a few days. And Jesus turns water into wine. It won't be long after that that Jesus takes a little lad's lunch and turns bread into more bread and fish into more fish. It's not a sin to get the bread. But it would have been wrong for Jesus to get the bread because he was proving a point in pride to Satan. It would have been wrong for Jesus to turn the rocks and stone into bread out of the will of God. Nobody would hold it against me if I went to Food City after church today and got a loaf of bread. Unless I got that loaf of bread and didn't pay for it. There's an order. There's an order. And the point that God wants us to see in the matter of overcoming temptation is God's word is more important than your need. You see, we have a need. We have a yearning and a desire to eat food because food gives us strength and gives us health and life. But we shouldn't get food to the neglect of our character. And we shouldn't gather food to the neglect of what's right. God gives us these desires and they're good. You know, hunger, hunger keeps you alive. Hunger keeps you alive. It's a gift from God. Hunger is a gift from God. It keeps you alive. I hear, I talk to folks, I would never, I've never experienced it. I talk to folks who've lost their appetite and it's a burden to eat. And to lose your appetite is something that's devastating. Uh, sometimes I wish I did lose my appetite a little bit. It'd be easier to lose some weight. But an appetite is something that God gave us, but it's to be fulfilled righteously. You don't steal your bread. God gives us appetites for different things. God's put into our core being, all of us, a desire for intimacy. He's put in our core being a desire to reproduce. But there's a specific order in which that has to be taken care of and God's order is perfect and right. You see, if you'll put your trust in God and get a job and earn a living and then buy your bread in order to get your strength, you've done things in God's order. But if you steal your bread because you need it, you've done something that will not only hurt you, but it'll hurt the people around you and the people that depend on you because you got it out of order. God's word is very clear on the order of the home and the order of intimacy. And you get it out of order, you know what happens? You make a big mess. God's given us hunger pains. You know why? Because it makes us get out of bed and go to work and be respectable citizens. God's given us these desires for intimacy and reproduction. Why? So that men will get out of their parents' basements and go get an education and a job and take on a wife and be responsible and raise children and have a home and be faithful. You see, you get it out of order. You got a big mess. You got people who don't have to work for their food. And as a result of not having to work for your food, and I'm all for feeding people that can't feed themselves. Don't get me wrong. But able-bodied people, God has designed us to earn our food. And when you've earned your food, it just tastes better. We were working outside yesterday on some lights, and I told Jim Riley, I said, you know, after you've been out in the cold and rain working a little while, it'll make your supper feel better. I mean, it make your supper taste better. And there's just something about working and eating that's right. God designed it that way. But you know what the devil wants to do? He wants to give you your bread. He wants to give you your bread. He wants to fulfill the lust of your flesh to the neglect of what God has designed to make you the man you ought to be or make you the woman you ought to be, to make you the teenager you ought to be. Put things in God's order and you'll have the blessings of God. And remember, God's word is more important than your need. Every time Jesus answers the tempter, he answers him with God's word. And he answers him with the person of God. When the devil said, turn this stone to bread, Jesus answered, it is written. Jesus confirmed his faith in God's word. Jesus confirmed the fact that he could trust God's word. He turned in his mind and his heart to the book of Deuteronomy and said, devil, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 8, 3, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word. What did Jesus say? Look, I'm hungry. 
I'm hungry. But I'm going to obey God and God's word. And I'm going to depend on God in the proper order to give me the bread that I need when I need it. Oh, if we'll determine that I'm going to obey God's word even though I have these yearnings and desires. I'm going to obey God's word even though I have this, this burning fire to have this or do that. If we'll say, I'm going to put it in God's order, in God's way, you won't believe this. God's order, God's way equals God's blessing. And when you're experiencing the things you want and desire in God's blessing, they are sweet with no bad aftertaste. They are pure with no consequences. They are right with no regret. Oh, it's wonderful. You see, the devil wants you to get what you, what you need, but he wants you to get it the wrong way because he wants to be able to hold it over your head and beat you down with it and ruin your life for it. God wants to give you what you need because he wants to bless you with it. He wants you to enjoy it. He wants you to experience the blessings of all of his blessing. Amen. Oh, may we learn God's word is more important than your need. Right. Number two. How do we overcome temptation? How do we get from this low time to God is ministering to us? Number two, we need to remember this. Pleasing God is more important than pleasing men. Now the next temptation looks like this, verse number five. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Now what does the devil do? The devil takes Jesus to the highest point in the holy city of Jerusalem. And in the holy city, no, there's, there's normally a large group of people. And he's in the holy city. And what I believe is the purpose here, he has this opportunity to perform a grand and glorious feat before the people in the city of Jerusalem. Now, Jesus would soon make a giant splash in the city of Jerusalem. He would make a name for himself and he would do the work of God. And the time was come and the order was set by God. But the devil takes his opinion. He says, I tell you what, if you want to really draw a crowd and you want to get people's jaws dropping down and you really want to blow their minds, from up here, fly, jump off. We know God has to catch you. We know God will prevent your death. Jump off and show everybody just how wonderful you are. You see, in the first temptation, the devil was tempting him with the lust of the flesh. In the second temptation, the devil is tempting him with the pride of life. This desire that we all have, and we all have it, we all have a desire to be somebody. We have a desire to, to receive honor. Men have an inbuilt yearning for respect. We want people to think highly of us. We want folks to be impressed with our skills. And the devil says, hey, look, cast yourself down. And then the devil says, you know what the Bible says. The devil uses a passage of scripture out of context the scripture says, it is written, the devil speaking, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He says, the Bible says you can do it. He took that passage out of context and it didn't mean anything like he, like he says. You know that there are folks who can take the Bible and make it say just about anything they want. We should never take God's word out of context. We could put it in its context and make sense out of it. I'm reminded of the man who said, I'm going to learn something from God's word. He didn't know the Bible, but he said, I'm just going to learn something from God's word. And he opened his Bible and closed his eyes and he went, Ch -ch 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 -ch. he said, whatever I put my finger on, that's what I'm going to do. He looked at his Bible and looked down at his finger and the Bible said, and Judas went out and hanged himself. He's like, that can't be right. He closed his eyes and did it again. And the Bible said, go and do thou likewise. <laughs> I don't think that's the word that came from heaven, do you? 
You see, the devil took God's word just because it says, they say it's the Bible doesn't mean you need to obey it. Put it in its context. It's understandable. You can understand it. The devil said, look, go, just cast yourself down. You'll make a scene. I'll tell you what, you'll put on a big show. I want you to know something. God is not interested in big shows. God is interested in working in the hearts and lives of people one person at a time on an individual basis, changing their lives, winning them to faith in Christ. You see, the devil tempted him and said, hey, just cast yourself down. It's written. The Bible says in verse number 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Pleasing God is more important than pleasing men. You know what we do? We're bad to put on a show so that men will give us applause. Oh, may God help us to overcome this temptation. May God help us to exalt the Savior, not ourselves. Pleasing God is more important than pleasing men. The young preacher was asked when he went to take a church, he says, how are you going to please all these people? And very wisely he responded. He said, it's not my job to please people. I've got one person to please. I'm going to please the Lord to the best of my ability and let the pieces fall where they may. Pleasing God. Pleasing God is more important than pleasing men. And Jesus looks at the devil. He says, it's wrong, it's written that you shouldn't tempt the Lord God. If he had jumped off that pinnacle and God had called him, well, what, did he, what had Jesus done? He would have tempted God. That was foolish. There's no sense in that. Do you know that God expects us? We've got this wonderful connection and union. We do and should do all we can in our lives. We should be diligent and work hard and be honest and forthright and all those wonderful things that make up a Christian character. And we should depend on God to meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Someone said it like this, we should work like it all depends on us. We should pray like it all depends on God and live our lives faithfully to the Lord. Jesus, could he have jumped off the pinnacle of the temple? Yes. Should he? No. It didn't make any sense. It's like a diabetic who God has provided a doctor and insulin and a glucometer saying, I'm just, I forget all that medicine stuff. I'm just going to, I'm just going to trust God the whole time he's eating a peanut butter sandwich and a piece of chocolate cake. You're not trusting God. You're tempting God. That's wrong. It's like I'm going to drive down the road 150 miles an hour. I'm just trusting God. Well, you're foolish. I'm going to buy this giant house. I'm just trusting God, but I don't have the money for it. You're not trusting God. You're tempting God. Don't be foolish. God expects you to act rationally and live holy and pure and do things decently in order and depend on him to meet all your needs and he will be faithful. Don't tempt God. The bottom line is when we step out and do silly things that tempt God, you know what we're doing? We're most interested in what other people think about us. The Bible teaches us if we're going to overcome temptation, we need to remember that God's word is more important than your need. Pleasing God is more important than pleasing men. And thirdly and finally, God's plan is greater than your plan. Look what the scripture says in verse number eight. <clears throat> Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The third temptation, the devil takes Jesus to a high mountain, and I can imagine there's a 360 degree view. The Bible says that he, was, he could look and see, and he, they, he showed him, specifically the Bible says, he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. 
And the devil says here, Jesus, I can see him putting his arm around Jesus. I don't think it went this way, but you can kind of see it with me. And he points that way. You can have that kingdom, the glories of Babylon, the glories of Rome. And he points that way and he says, you can have that kingdom, the Asias. You can have that kingdom, the, the Africas and all the people and all the power and all the resources can be yours. Have you ever noticed that the devil will promise you the whole world, but he has nothing to offer? You see it. He promised you the whole world. Health, wealth, prosperity, peace, joy, love. He'll promise it all. But he has nothing to offer you but destruction. The devil says, hey, look, I'll give you all this. And there's no doubt the Bible teaches us that the devil is the prince of the power of the air. And he has some authority. He has some wooing and opportunity and the leadership of men and the rising of nations and wickedness, all that is abroad. And he looks at Jesus. He says, now, Jesus, you can have this if you'll just bow down and worship me. You can have it. If you'll just, just bend the knee a little bit. Just bend the knee a little bit. Now, I want you to know why this was alluring, and it could have been alluring. I don't think Jesus could have ever sinned in this situation, but I want you to see why it could have been alluring. Jesus knew as the Son of God that in just a few short years, in just a few short days, he would take the cat of nine tails and the beating. He knew in just a few short days he'd have his cross and he'd bear it as far as he could before he handed it off and made his way to Calvary. Jesus knew in a few short days that he would hang on a cross between heaven and hell and suffer our sin and our death for us. And there was a luring nature to this temptation. He said, you know what? You can have all this power. He was talking to the king of kings and lord of lords and the devil says, king of kings and lord of lords, you can have all this power. You can have it right now. No cross. All you got to do is bow. Folks, I want you to know something. Satan promises you all kinds of things. And you may experience the power and you may experience some of the glories of the flesh and of this world and you may have some highs and you may enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but I'll have you know something. Your pride and your desire to have what you want now as opposed to what God wants you to have in his proper time and you, you're avoiding the crosses, you're avoiding the difficult times, you're avoiding the seasons of life where you have to trust in God. You are not getting anything. You are robbing yourself of the blessings of God. Just imagine, he couldn't have, don't get me wrong, he couldn't have, he wouldn't, Jesus wouldn't sin. But had he chosen to take the world there today, every other little boy, Little girl that represents all of us for all of time would have suffered hell because he said, I don't want to take the cross. You see, our actions weigh on more than just us. Our actions have consequences that affect more than just me. It affects my wife and my kids, my mother, my nieces and nephews, my father, grandparents, if the Lord blesses grandkids to come. My actions and your actions affect everybody around you. And generations to come. And God wants us to remember that when we face temptation, God's plan is better than your plan. You see, I want it all, and I want it now. But God has an order. And if I wait on the Lord, and I'll avoid the temptation, He'll give me what I need, when I need it, the way I need it, and He'll bless me. You remember? Jesus has fasted 40 days. 
he began to be hungered. He was hungry. He's low, weak, in need. The temptation came. He walked through the temptation every time, citing the word of God and the faithfulness of God. And at the end of the story, the Bible says that the devil departed. And the angels of God ministered to Jesus. You know what the angels of God did? They didn't just give him a little bread. You know what the angels of God did? They didn't just give him a little bit of praise and accolade. You know what the angels of God did? They didn't just give him a little bit of power and make him feel better about himself for a few minutes. The angels of God came and gave Jesus exactly what he needed, exactly when he needed it and prepared him for the work that he was going to do. You know what we do when we fall to temptation? When we take and we fulfill the lust of our flesh before it's time, before it's right, and get things out of order. You know what we do? We rob ourselves of the opportunity to be ministered to by God. You know what God's going to do? He is going to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. You know what God's going to do? He's going to make you complete. You don't have to follow the temptation. Temptation's high pressure, isn't it? It's rough sometimes. I read this story and I thought it might help you. There's a nuclear submarine that the U.S. had years ago. As far as I can tell, one of only two that have ever sank. This nuclear submarine, I think it was called the Thresher. Don't hold it against me if I didn't get it right. But the Thresher, it had cruised down to a real deep spot in the ocean. And something happened and malfunctioned. As far as we know, the nuclear reactor shut off. And the ship submarine began to sink deeper and deeper in the water. At 2,400 feet, below the earth's surface, the pressure was so great on the outside of that submarine that in an instant, nobody even knew what happened other than they knew what was, could happen. In an instant, they said that the pressure on the outside of that submarine was so great that the water that came in when it crushed came in at 2,600 miles per hour. Somebody smarter than me figured that out. But, boom, the power. They said that the sound that that made 2,400 feet in the sea could have been heard like a 1,000 miles away. It's wild, isn't it? The pressure of the sea, boom. Do you know what's amazing to me? At the exact same spot, where that submarine was crushed, there were little fish swimming around. That submarine had a shell and a hull that was designed, to, they knew it could go 1,900 feet. But swimming around right where that submarine imploded were little fish. <laughs> What's the difference? God designed those little fish with thin skin to have a pressure inside of them that matched the pressure around them and they could swim in that deep water and survive because of what God had put in them, the pressure in them. The pressure in them. You see, you can put fortified walls around you to try to... For to prevent temptation. But I'll have you know something. Those walls are not stronger than Satan. That's right. And you can cast this out and you can cast that out and you can clean this up. 
But I'll have you know something. The only way you'll overcome the pressure of temptation is to have Christ in your heart and daily fill yourself and pressurize the inside of you with the Spirit of God, the Word of God, the presence of God because only then can you overcome the pressures that surround you. It's the pressure inside. It's what's inside that prevents the pressures from the outside crushing and overcoming. I think the Bible says it perfectly. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. Folks, we can overcome temptation beginning right now. Why? Because we have the presence of God. We have the word of God. May we remember God's word is more important than your need. Wait on God. Pleasing God is more important than pleasing men. Rest in God. God's plan is greater than your plan. Trust in God. Overcoming temptation, you can. Put it in God's hands. Be filled with the Spirit.